Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 26. We are back in this beloved gospel, Matthew, after uh, probably three months of uh, not being in here. We've had a break because of the holidays. We had some Christmas time, and then we had a series on the church, and I told you that uh, I was going to get back into Matthew and plan the passages and services up until Easter and beyond. And so uh, it just so happens that if we continue on this path, we'll be having the, the, the passage in Matthew 28 on the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday, which is April 17th. All right. I didn't know that Gene was, uh, had selected the passage of Scripture in Philippians, but that's what I want to start with in my introduction. Paul, as you heard and as we read a little bit ago, made a profound statement about the Lord Jesus that gives us insight into the choices that he made and the actions that he took while he lived on this earth. And I'm just going to quote a portion of that. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Though Jesus was equal with God the Father in every way, possessing identical divine attributes and prerogatives, he voluntarily relinquished the independent use of those attributes and prerogatives while he was on this earth. That's an important point. Paul says he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Literally, he did not count equality with God a thing to be used for his own advantage. So, for the 33 years Jesus lived on earth, he voluntarily laid aside these divine prerogatives and completely submitted to the will of his Father. And this morning, we're going to look at one of the most extraordinary examples of how Jesus made this choice, even though it cost him dearly, ultimately his life, and how that choice changed human history. It is late Thursday evening of Holy Week. Earlier in the evening, Jesus had observed the Passover meal with his disciples. After supper, they retreated to the Mount of Olives where he told all of them that they would abandon him that very night. Peter was incredulous, declaring that he would die before denying or abandoning Jesus. After that, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane because Jesus wanted to spend some time with his Father in prayer. He asked his disciples to join him, though they soon fell asleep. Jesus was in great agony and pleaded with his Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And after some time, Jesus woke them. In verse 47, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. It, it is likely that Matthew identifies Judas as one of the twelve to highlight the irony and tragedy of his treachery. 
And furthermore, in, in using the singular verb and adding that a crowd was with him, Judas, Matthew emphasizes Judas's role and responsibility in Jesus Jesus' arrest, rather than the others who accompanied him, who actually performed the arrest. These others came from the chief priests and elders of the people, which suggests that they were official representatives of the ruling body of Judaism known as the Sanhedrin. Matthew wants us to know that these people were not just rabble-rousers, They were sent on a mission by the most powerful leaders in Judaism. That reference to swords, which were short daggers or knives that were normally tied to one's belt, indicates that some Roman soldiers were also present. Indeed, John references this in his gospel account, identifying them as a detachment of soldiers. And those who wielded clubs were most likely the Jews that were there because clubs were commonly used by Jews as a weapon at this time. Now, why would this crowd come to the garden prepared for a skirmish? Why would the Jewish leaders arrange for a detachment of Roman soldiers to accompany them? Did they view Jesus as an insurrectionist? Had they seen him do anything that would lead them to believe that he might act aggressively? You might remember that a few days earlier, Jesus had indeed caused a scene in the temple courts by angrily overturning tables and driving out merchants, even with a whip. Other than that, however, there was nothing about his behavior that even hinted at violence. But remember this. A number of people in Jerusalem at this time wondered if Jesus was the Messiah. And the popular Jewish perception of the Messiah is that he would overthrow the Roman Empire and reign in God's kingdom. They believed that Messiah would indeed be an insurrectionist and that he would, of necessity, use violence and force to establish his rule. And thus the chief priests and elders may have wondered if there was perhaps a more militant element to Jesus' organization than met the eye. Whatever the case, they wanted to be prepared. Look at verse 48. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Men in the ancient Middle East customarily greeted one another with kisses on both cheeks. But Judas's deceitful display of friendship hurt here only serves to heighten his treachery. He, he pretends to come in peace, and he uses a term of respect, teacher, to identify Jesus. It is not only a signal to the mob, but his final repudiation of his master. That kiss was a slap in Jesus' face. Try to imagine what it would be like to be Jesus in this situation. It is the middle of the night. He is surrounded by a mob carrying swords, clubs, and torches. He has been betrayed by a friend whom Satan has entered and He's become the personification of evil. He is about to be pounced on. 
The tension is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Someone who did not know Jesus might have expected him to react by saying something like, Damn you to hell, Judas. Your name will live in infamy because of this. Instead, verse 50, Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Rather than panic, Rather than getting flustered, rather than getting defensive or disgusted, Jesus gives Judas his attention and calls him friend. And though it is possible to interpret that as a sarcastic statement, I rather think that Jesus was one last time showing Judas who he really was. Judas had shown his true colors. Jesus was showing his true colors. He was loving his enemies just as he admonished his followers to do in the Sermon on the Mount. Second part of verse 50, then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and cut the servant of the high priest and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. All four Gospels tell us that there was a brief and an ineffective show of resistance from Jesus' disciples. Luke records that his disciples asked him, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And that before Jesus had a chance to respond, one of the disciples drew his sword and cut off the right ear of the high priest's servant. John tells us that that person was Peter and then identifies the man who was attacked as Malchus. Luke A doctor tells us that Jesus picked up the man's ear and put it back on and healed it. It is difficult to say exactly what motivated Peter's action. Perhaps he was haunted by Jesus' prediction that he would deny him three times that very night. And he was trying to prove to Jesus that he was not a coward. Perhaps he was just acting impulsively. Regardless, verse 52, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? You know, Peter ought to have been arrested for attacking an official with a sword. And it's likely that he would have been had not Jesus promptly intervened. But Jesus instructs Peter to put his sword back in its place. And then proceeds to make three statements. First, all those who take the sword will perish by the sword. Peter viewed his weapon as a means of protecting himself and Jesus. But Jesus viewed Peter's weapon as something that contradicted all that he, the Prince of Peace, stood for. Furthermore, Peter was overlooking the principle that that violence breeds violence and that people who use deadly force against others risk others using deadly force against them. And that is a most unfitting end 
for a servant of the Prince of Peace. But there's something even more incongruent about Peter's use of a sword on this occasion. Jesus says to him, do you not, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Peter had been with Jesus for three years now. He had seen him demonstrate his divine power over and over. Did he really think that Jesus could not help himself if he wanted to? Indeed, Jesus tells him that he could have asked his father to send more than 12 legions of angels to rescue him. You know, since a legion consisted of 6,000 soldiers, that would be an army of 72 thousand angelic beings who are far stronger than human beings. We read in Joshua 5 that Jesus is the commander of angel armies, the army of the Lord. So had Jesus wanted to resist or escape, all he had to do was speak a word and he would have been immediately delivered by invisible and irresistible forces. But remember, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Though Jesus was equal with God in every way, possessing identical divine attributes and prerogatives, he voluntarily relinquished the independent use of those attributes and prerogatives while he was on this earth. He did not use them for his own advantage. He voluntarily laid them aside and completely submitted to his Father's will, even unto death. And the Father had revealed his will long before Jesus came into this world. 740 years before Jesus was even born, the prophet Isaiah wrote, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. I I, I think it's, without a doubt, Jesus was referring to this passage when he said to Peter, verse 54, how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Then Jesus turned his attention to the whole group that had come to arrest him. Verse 55, at that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. (laughs) Jesus is addressing the elephant in the room. They had encountered Jesus in the temple every day that week. 
And it would have been much more convenient. It would have been a whole lot easier to apprehend him there and haul him over to the house of the high priest, which was just a stone's throw away. Instead, they had furtively come to this remote place in the middle of the night so that his arrest would attract the least amount of publicity possible. In other words, there was something sneaky, something sinister about what they were doing, how they were going about it. If true justice was their main concern, they could have done this publicly in broad daylight. But true justice was not their concern. The ones who sent them had a personal vendetta against Jesus, and they were determined to get rid of him by whatever means, even if they had to resort to devious methods. They also knew that if they had publicly arrested Jesus, they would have had opposition, for Luke tells us that they were afraid of the people. But ultimately, Jesus wants them to know that their cunning behavior was prophesied in their own scriptures. Verse 56. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. In treating Jesus as a criminal, the chief priests and elders were actually fulfilling what the scripture had foretold long ago. Isaiah had prophesied that he would be numbered with the transgressors. Verse 56b, then all the disciples left him and fled. It seems apparent that the disciples had been unaware of Judas's sinister plot and were shocked to see him leading this posse to arrest Jesus. They saw Peter's pathetic attempt to resist and then heard Jesus rebuke him for it. And now Jesus, instead of doing something miraculous, was calmly reasoning with the ones who apprehended him. It was too much for them to bear. And so they panicked and ran for their lives, leaving Jesus all alone. As I have contemplated the significance of this passage in terms of its application for us, I am going to, uh, to, to resist the obvious temptation to warn us against being like Judas who betrayed Jesus or Peter who resorted to violence to try to defend, defend Jesus or the disciples who abandoned Jesus. Nor am I going to consider the merits or lack thereof of using verse 52 as a proof text to support pacifism. I, I, I believe the most profitable thing that we can consider from this passage is what we can learn from our Lord Jesus, particularly in his profound demonstrations of faith and love. Three things. First, Jesus refused to take matters into his own hands, but put his complete trust in his heavenly Father so that his will could be done. Don't forget, he was equal with God in every way possessing identical divine attributes and prerogatives. 
but he voluntarily relinquished the independent use of those attributes and prerogatives while he was on this earth in order to do his father's will. And it was his father's will that he be the sin bearer for mankind, the one who would bear our sins in his body and be punished in our place. It was his father's will to crush his son by making him a guilt offering for us. And though Jesus, in the words of the song, could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, he instead died alone for you and me. He relinquished the independent use of his divine power to destroy his enemies and allowed his enemies to destroy him so that we might not be destroyed in hell, but have eternal life. Let's just say that Jesus had called 10,000 angels to set him free and deliver him from this death you and I would not be here. The world would have self-destructed long ago, and every person that had ever lived would now be in hell. There would have been absolutely no hope and no remedy for the human race, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son And that son put his complete trust in his father's will because he knew that his own death was the father's method of rescuing the human race from its lost and sinful condition. Second, because Jesus trusted his father, Because he trusted his father, he could remain calm and composed during an extremely tense and combative situation. We learned in the previous passage that when Jesus was praying in the garden, he was anything but calm. He was in such deep anguish as he anticipated being the the object of his father's wrath that we are told that he sweat great drops of blood. But when he emerged from that prayer after determining that he would submit to his father's will, he was no different than he was on any other occasion. He wasn't flustered. He didn't panic. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't get agitated in any way. And I submit to you that this wasn't because he was just trying to be cool or macho. I don't even think he was trying to be brave. He was calm and composed simply because he trusted his father. Yes, he knew that his father was about to crush him. But he also knew the very next verse in Isaiah's prophecy that he would see the suffering of his soul and be satisfied. The writer of Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross despising his shame, its shame. He knew that the reward of his suffering would be worth it in the end. And then third, Jesus distinguished himself as the Son of God by giving individuals his undivided attention in this volatile, 
situation. Remember? He looked at Judas square in the eyes and called him friend. He told Peter to put his sword away, and then he gave him a lesson in theology. He calmly picked up Malchus's severed ear and reattached it. He addressed the crowd. In fact, John's gospel tells us that after Judas kissed Jesus, Jesus turned to the crowd and said, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And when he said, I am he, they involuntarily fell back. Why? I wouldn't be surprised if it was out of shame. Deep down inside, they knew this was no ordinary man. His poise, his attitudes, his reactions, his behavior distinguished him as none other than the Son of God. His goodness exposed their sin and magnified it. And I don't know about you, these things compel me to admire Jesus all the more. They inspire me to love him more deeply and to be devoted to him with all of my heart. They compel me to want to cry out, Hallelujah! What a Savior! This is our Jesus. And He did it because He loves us.